Okay, here we are, back again, ladies and gentlemen. One Piece, live action, Netflix series, episode six, The Chef and the Chore Boy. I am, okay, I already filmed this episode. <laughs> like, five days ago, I filmed this. And after about an hour, I wrote down all the notes. I was so prepared. I was like, this is it. I'm getting back on these live action episode discussions. We only got three left. Episode six, seven, and eight. So I do episode six. And then this is what happened to the audio. We, we now, now cut, cut back, back to the Mary, where uh, Sanji is actually in the kitchen preparing food for everybody. Because it's been a rough morning. It... <laughs> <laughs> it has been a while since I have been, like, fist-slammingly mad at, like, something like that. Like, you know, back in the day, you know, every now and then I would film a whole video and, like, the microphone was turned off the whole time. Like, that kind of stuff happened. It's been a while, though. It's been a while since something like that happened. And there was no way to fix it. I mean, I even went to Rustage and I was just like, is there any way to fix this? And he's like, nah, you're screwed, mate. So we're doing it again. Episode 6 discussion, take 2. Are you ready for this, Barry? Yeah! You ready for this, Barry's dad? Yeah! Alright, let's go. Alright, so episode 5 left off with the epic duel between Zoro and Mihawk. And I have to say, the live action, I mean, they changed a lot of things. But this was one particular scene. And I hope to see a lot of scenes like this in the future where they knew they had to make this as accurate to the manga as possible. And in that regard, I think they did an amazing job. Like, all the dialogue was basically the same. All of the moments, like the plot beats of the fight where, you know, Mihawk takes out the smaller knife and, like, stabs Zoro and then Zoro goes to attack and then he the, the moment where he takes out the Yoru and like scars on the back are a swordsman's shame and the Mihawk is just like magnificent and then you know brings it down um the only real thing I think they added in that fight was the inclusion of Nami being there the fact that Nami was there because at that point she had already betrayed the crew and taken the ship and left so in this scene Nami has actually had some moments to become you know closer with Zoro like they had the drinking game and everything like that and there was the moment where Nami is there not wanting to see Zoro die and like holds Usopp's hand like oh my god this is coming he might die here and that might be it right so this episode picks up right where that one left off we had of course Zoro's declaration as right before he passed out out, you know, I will never lose again. And then Mihawk told, you know, Luffy and everything just like, hey, you know, he he'll probably live, you know, challenge me again one day, all that kind of stuff. And then Mihawk leaves. Okay. So the episode opens up with the crew, you know, hoisting Zoro into the Mary. Uh, it's still the early morning hours of the day. The Baratier is not even open yet. So they lug him into the going Mary and they're like, okay, he's losing a lot of blood here. I don't know what to do. Where is the, where did Kaya put the first aid kit? I don't know where this is. Right. So they're like just just grabbing a bunch of towels and everything, trying to staunch the bleeding. Um, you know, what's fascinating about this is in this version of events, there's really not a lot of other stuff going on, like, in the background. Like, while that duel happened in the anime and in the manga, Don Krieg was in the middle of his attack. So after Zoro was cut down by Mihawk, it was kind of like an intermission there. Uh, you know, Johnny and Usopp kind of, you know, grabbed Zoro and got him in the boat, and then they moved forward. They kind of went to the Konomi Islands first, all right, ahead of Luffy, while Luffy and Sanji and everybody uh, dealt with Don Krieg. Well, Don Krieg's not there any anymore. Uh, Mihawk killed him in the last episode, just straight up killed him. I mean, since Mihawk's gone, and there's no other threat at the Baratier, we actually have a very interesting scene where everybody can just focus on the aftermath of the duel, on the, the fact that Zoro might very well die here. He's unconscious and he's losing a lot of blood, all right? So Nami's still there as well, and she's trying to do something to stop the bleeding, and Usopp's freaking out. And then Luffy kind of has, like, a panic attack kind of moment where, like, the sound goes away, like, he's losing the sound, and just like, wait, what? And, like, Luffy's starting to, like, spin around. And that is a whole aspect of Luffy's character that is really not touched upon in the manga. It's really just, like, now, obviously, Luffy... Luffy is upset when he sees Zoro get cut down right in front of him, but after the declaration of like, you know, is that okay, king of the pirates, I'll never lose again, and Luffy's like, yeah, and then, yeah, he's upset, but then he also has to fight Krieg right after this, and it's sort of like, there's not really a moment to stop and focus on Zoro. Now there is, and we're seeing when 
Luffy has to deal with this. The idea of like, I'm going to head out to sea and I'm going to find the One Piece and I'm going to have this great adventure and I'm going to have my crew and they're going to be my Nakama. They're going to be all my friends and it's going to be fun. And then boom, you see Zoro get cut down right in front of you. And Nami's like, dude, Luffy, he could die here. Like, this is real. This is not a paper cut, you know? And so you need to go back to the Baratier. And Luffy's like, I don't, I don't think I'm really that hungry, Nami. And so, and that's another thing too. Luffy, throughout this episode, he's offered food many times, and he's just like, I'm not hungry. And that's that's the best way to determine whether Luffy's going through something right now. Is like, Luffy, do you want a a, a delicious uh, steak or perhaps a corn dog? And Luffy's just like, No, nah, I'm not hungry. It's like, what? Okay, there's some serious is going on here, right? So Luffy, he's like, Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, the Baratier. There must be. There might be a doctor there. Maybe there's a doctor staying at the Baratier, or there's a doctor like dining there or something like that. I'm going to go, you know, in there. So we cut back to the Baratier as uh, Sanji is doing, like, brunch prep because, you know, uh, Zef banned him from the line cooking. You know, he's like, you're just the, you know, you're basically the waiter, essentially. But, you know, Sanji's back in the kitchen early in the morning, you know, preparing food. And he's like, well, Patty's got a hangover and Carne doesn't exist. So Carne doesn't exist in this adaptation, old man. So what do you want? Do you want to be completely unprepared for brunch or do you want to help me with this? And so we have a nice little, it's very brief, but it's a cute little scene where we see Zef and Sanji doing like prep together in the kitchen and they're like cutting carrots and Zeph is like, you know, they're kind of shit talking one another. There's like those carrots are too thin. Those eggs are too runny. Oh, you could use some more oregano and Sanji's like oregano's for savages. And that's going to be a little bit of a callback to their past that we're going to get to. See, the last episode might have been the episode that introduced Sanji and Zeph and the Baratier, but the overall focus of that episode was way more about Mihawk. Okay, that the whole thing with like Mihawk arriving at the Baratier and then Zoro challenging him and everything like that. That was the main focus of that episode. So this is the episode that focuses on Sanji. So we find out about Sanji's backstory with Zeph on the rock and everything like that. And we're going to get to that in a moment. And they actually do, they don't change the backstory itself all that much. But they do change the way that Sanji conveys it. So we'll get to that when we get to that. So anyway, Luffy barges into the kitchen while they're doing prep. And it's just like, uh, Zoro dueled the warlord guy and he got cut and he's losing a lot of blood. And we don't know what to do. Is this, is there a doctor in the house? And uh, Zeph is like, oh, uh, no, there isn't. Sorry, uh, the nearest doctor's on the Konomi Islands. That's like a few days sail away. Now, it's interesting that Zeph brought that up, and I made a note of that. So the nearest doctor would be on the Konomi Islands. That's Kokoyashi Village, and that's actually the doctor uh, Nako who is the doctor that helps Zoro eventually. Ultimately, in the manga, he's the one that stitches up Zoro's wounds. Because Zoro just goes like, they don't treat the wound. They just kind of throw a bunch of bandages on it and just hope it'll heal on its own. So all the fights that Zoro gets in at Arlong Park, where he fights Hachi and even Arlong briefly, he's got like this gaping chest wound that's like not healed properly, and it's like not going to close on its own. And then after the battle at Arlong Park, Nako is the one that like, is like stitching up Zoro. Like, you idiot, did you think this was gonna heal on its own you're a moron you know and that was also the moment where luffy and everybody kind of realized like wow we, we really need a doctor <laughs> so instead of that being the scene in arlong park where they realize they really really need a doctor this is kind of the moment where they realize a doctor is essential at being on a crew right but unfortunately uh you know the doctor's not on the baratier also nako does not show up in the live action at all for what's going to happen here in a moment because zoro's wound is not left untreated until Arlong Park, it is treated here at the Baratier, and the one that does it is Zeph, actually, in a very clever kind of way. So, Sanji, you know, he hears about Zoro being injured, and he's, like, instantly like, Zoro's in danger? I'll help. <laughs> it's like, okay, now, I, you were with me up until this point, One Piece Netflix. You were with me up until this point, when Sanji would offer to help Zoro, but now... You know, obviously they just met, you know, I don't think Sanji and Zoro have had more than like a, a couple of words exchanged between one another, you know what I mean? I, there's really not a moment yet where they have their like rivalry, okay? And also, if, if Zoro really was in danger of dying, I'm sure Z uh, Sanji would help him and vice versa, you know what I mean? Well, anyway, Sanji's like, hey, Zef, you told me to feed anybody that was hungry and in need of food. I don't see how this is any different. So he goes over, he tries to gather some stuff together to help Zoro, and then... um. 
Zeph is like, okay, well, you know what? I'm, I'll, I'll go help you. Get me the finest uh, yellow tail you can find out of the freezer. The fresher, the better. Get my kitchen knives and then meet me over there. We're going to go save your friend's life, okay? So I can imagine everybody sitting around, and they didn't have to do this, by the way. Like, the writing staff could have easily just wrote in a character at the Baratier, and they could have just had him be a doctor, right? Like, they could have just went over to the Baratier and be like, is there a doctor in the house? And then they could have had a brand new character, or they could have had Nako here. Like, Nako, instead of being from Kokoyashi, was at the Baratier for whatever reason. And it's like, I'm a doctor, I'll save your friend. You know, and it could have been a moment like that, where it was like, oh, cool, do you want to join our crew? And it's like, nah, not really, but you should get a doctor. You know, it could have been something like that, right? But no, they actually sit around and they're like, okay, which characters are on the Baratier that could actually maybe uh, stitch up Zoro or would know about, you know, healing wounds like this, right? And they're thinking, okay, well, we have Zeph. Zeph was a captain of the Cook Pirates, and he had been a pirate for years and years. Clearly, Zeph had seen... I mean, he also amputated his own leg at one point, so clearly Zeph might know something. Like, so he might not know how to perform, like, actual legitimate surgery, but he might know how to do some things to keep you alive like that, okay? And, and so that's what they do. So they bring Zeph over to the Going Merry, and everyone's like, Luffy, we told you to get a, a doctor, not a chef! So, uh, they take this big yellow tail, they lay it down, and Zeph takes out his kitchen knives, and he fillets the fish, you know, and, like, you know, rips its head off and debones it and everything, cuts its skin off right in front of them, takes the skin of the yellowtail and begins to stitch up Zoro's wounds and then lays the fish skin over the wound. And Zeph explains, like, this is an old sailor's trick back in the day. Uh, it helps staunch the wounds, helps keeps infection out, and it helps. It's kind of like a skin graft, like an old school way of a skin graft. I don't know if this was an actual thing. Uh, I probably should have looked that up. This is the second time filming it. You think I should have looked that up, but whatever. You'll let me know if it was if it was an actual thing that sailors did back in the days of piracy or whatever, right? So maybe this would work, maybe it wouldn't. Um, but it's kind of like an early form of a skin graft. In the world of One Piece, I could see this working, okay? I could see this working, right? And so Zeph is like, look, I'm no doctor. Your friend basically has one foot in the grave, one foot in the world of the living. You know, um, you know talk to him, you know, sing him sea shanties for all I care. Just let him know know that you're around him, okay? And that's, like, the best that, Z that Zeph can really offer. He's like, listen, this is all I can do. Um, I've seen this trick been done before. I'm sure Zeph has seen it work a few times, and I'm sure he's seen it fail a few times. And it's like, this is the best you got. Um, but Zeph, being a pirate captain, also knows how important it is to have a crew. And it's like, at the end of the day... As long as you're there next to him, talking to him, letting him know, like, even if he does does end up dying, even if Zoro dies right here of his wounds and his blood loss, you know, because they can't do a transfusion or anything. They can't give him more blood, so it's like, this is all we got. We can close up the wound and hope for the best and hope to keep infection away, and that's it. So, he's like, at least if you're there next to him and you're talking to him and you're letting him know that his crew is with him... Even if he dies, that's kind of like the best circumstance for someone to die on a pirate crew, at least to know that everyone's there for you, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, that's that's all Zeph can do, and so he leaves. And so now we have a scene where we cut back over to uh, Garp and Kobe on the marine ship, on Garp's battleship, and we have a scene between Garp and Mihawk. Now, this is a thing with, like, the parallel dimension or whatever you want to call it with the live action. It's like, we get moments like this. There's one in the next episode I really can't wait to talk about when Garp meets Zeph and they have a discussion. Which is like, yeah, they would have some stuff to talk about. So, in the last episode, Garp was the one that actually uh, ordered or hired Mihawk to go and bring in Luffy. And he specifically ordered, you know, make sure to bring him in alive no matter what, right? And many people are thinking that many people didn't like that change because it's like, whoa, you know, Garp is ordering a warlord to bring in Luffy, you know, like that's overkill. Like what if Mihawk just murdered him? To be fair, Garp did, you know, enlist the help of one of the warlords. Like the whole idea of that was Garp doesn't want Luffy to be a pirate. That's the whole overarching thing for him in this season, okay? I don't want my grandson to go to the Grand Line and get murdered, okay? I want him to understand how dangerous dangerous the ocean is. And the only way to do that, I mean, he tries a few other ways, but the only way for him to do that by the time of last episode was like, okay, I need to get a heavy hitter in here. I need to show him the absolute gap in power between you, like Luffy, and Mihawk, who's the strongest swordsman in the world, right? Now, Mihawk is the one of the ones of the warlords that, you know, he's not... 
he, he does a lot of his own thing, and he's going to say that in a moment here. But, you know, it's either him or Kuma, really. Like, if Garp would have ordered him or Kuma to, like, hey, I have a job for you. There's this pirate named Monkey D. Luffy. I want him brought in to me, but I want him alive. Kuma and Mihawk are probably the ones that are the most likely, eh, probably Jinbei too, that would actually carry out those orders, that wouldn't murder him, you know? It's not like Garp was like, hey, Doflamingo, I have a job for you. <laughs> hey, D hey, Moria, get off your ass. I have a job for you. No, it's like he was smart to go with Mihawk. I, probably the smarter move would have been Kuma, but, you know, we can't introduce... How, how weird would that be if Kuma was introduced in the East Blue? Kuma, I have a job for you. I need you to bring in Monkey D. Luffy. Probably the same thing would have happened with Kuma, but I could see this with Mihawk as well. So Garp walks into his office. Mihawk's hanging out in Garp's chair, feet up on the desk. Yoru's right there in front of him. And, uh, hello, Vice Admiral. And by the way, I love Stephen John Ward playing Mihawk. I mean, his is like a breakout performance. Him and Jeff Ward playing Buggy. And once again, I don't think there's any familial connection between them. Maybe there is. But I guess the rule is, if you have anybody with the last name Ward in this show, they're going to play their characters expertly. Because Stephen John Ward playing Mihawk is, the portrayal is, is spot on. And Jeff Ward playing Buggy is hilarious. And so we're going to see him as well later in this episode too so yeah I, I honestly hope to see more of them in season two like Mihawk doesn't pop in that much in the series but it would be cool every once in a while to see him you know just like ah yes this is what's going on with the straw hats this week yeah you know maybe something ah they defeated crocodile I see interesting you know it could be something like that in season two I guess we'll see right well anyway um Garp is like oh Mihawk where's Luffy and so Mihawk's like, hmm, yes, I, I decided to let him go. He's like, that wasn't what we discussed. You know, it's like, and I do exactly what I say, Vice Admiral. I do exactly what I want, Vice Admiral. And Garp has this moment where he brings up a little bit of the lore, and he's like, well, since you're a member of the Warlords and you work for the express purpose of the world government, you are required to, and then Mihawk kind of cuts him off when he goes on the spiel about, like, he's trying, like, Garp is trying to pull rank on him, kind of, like, eh, I'm a vice admiral of the world government, of the Marines, and the Marines work for the world government, and you work for the world government, so you're kind of supposed to listen to what we say, and Garp is like, you know, oh, without our protection, you would be, and then Mihawk's like, I would still be doing exactly what I, whatever I would want to do, no more and no less, you know, that, that's basically the idea, you know what I mean? Like, Mihawk, it doesn't matter if he's a warlord. He didn't, he didn't join the warlords because he was forced into it or they made him. He joined because he wanted to. And they make that very abundantly clear here, okay? There's supposed to be a, a hierarchy. There's supposed to be an order of all this. But at the end of the day, Mihawk only goes where he wants to go and he does what he wants to do. All right, Garp told him, like, hey, there's this young upstart named Luffy in the east. I want you to bring him in alive. That piqued Mihawk's curiosity. And really, he had nothing else going on. So he's like, yeah, all right, I'll check it out, I guess. And he show up and he not only meets Luffy, but he meets Zoro. And he's like, all right, okay, yeah, that's that piqued my interest. But I'm not going to bring these guys in or kill them because I'm bored as the greatest swordsman in the world. I want to see Zoro, you know, survive this and get stronger and challenge me again. And I'm also interested in this straw hat kid. And he sees Luffy with the straw hat and he's like, I like your hats. You know, because that reminds me of Shanks. And it used to be Shanks' hat. I'm sure Mihawk knew that. And so he was like, you know, I'm not going to bring these kids in. I want to see what they can accomplish, you know. And he even says to Garp directly, and Kobe's kind of listening at the door. That's mostly of what Kobe does this entire season is just eavesdrop on conversations with Garp but he's like you know maybe he might find the one piece who knows and then Mihawk walks out and Garp is so pissed Garp is infuriated he's just like yeah you know like everybody he sends he even sent a warlord at Luffy and even Luffy was kind of able to charm Mihawk a little bit to get him to not bring him in and, and Mihawk's like he's an interesting one vice admiral he might in fact find the one piece and Garp's like damn it that's the last thing I wanted to hear and you just you have a shot where Kobe's listening at the door and just thrashing and ex explosions and like like the entire furniture in the office is getting thrown around and you just pan over to see Garp's office just destroyed like Garp just you know like smashed the desk in half and threw it on the wall and he just like just destroyed everything but we don't see it but it was a it was a clever way of like a camera trick of just how strong Garp is really you know like he can just bench press a battleship if he wanted to right 
So there's that really good scene there. Then we cut back into the Mary, where uh, Zeph is back at the Baratier, but Sanji stayed in the Mary, and he's preparing lunch for everybody. They, they've been through a lot in the last 24 hours, so he's, like, preparing food for everyone, and it's Usopp and Luffy there. Luffy's like, I don't want to eat, I'm not hungry, and he's, like, polishing the Wado, which he calls the, the Wadai Ichi, Ichi Monkey, or Ichi Monkey, <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, what's that? It's like, oh, that's the name of Zoro's sword, and it's like, why does it have a name? It's like, I don't know, I guess it's special or something, but he's gonna want this after he wakes up so i think it was very clever the way to write luffy in the way of like luffy doesn't know how to deal with these kind of situations like he really doesn't luffy's never dealt with something i mean i guess he kind of has with shanks but when shanks lost an arm it was kind of like uh, don't worry about it luffy it's okay shanks clearly wasn't dying here zoro could die and Luffy has to kind of struggle with, like, I don't know how to deal with grief, okay? So he's doing a thing that I think, if you've ever lost anybody in your life, you know, if you've ever had a situation where somebody's really sick, or somebody's like, like, I'll, I'll be a little bit personal here, and I'll tell you a story, okay? A few years ago, me and my mom went down to North Carolina to visit my aunt and my uncle. My aunt had uh, terminal skin cancer, and uh, we got there, and it was so bad. Like, it was way worse than we thought it was, and she ended up passing away the following day. So we literally got there, and it was like only a night we got to spend with her, and she was in a hospital bed, and it was like, oh, it was like she was covered in tumors. Like, it was it was not a pretty sight, but it was she was aware of herself, so we were able to talk to her a little bit, and we were able to see her before she passed, um, and yeah— and we didn't really, I didn't really know what to do in that situation because it's like, you know, what do you do? And my, uh, my uncle's house, obviously he was focused on taking care of his wife. So, you know, there was a lot of like laundry and stuff that he hadn't done. So I'm like, oh, I know I'll clean up the living room. And so then that's what me and my mom ended up doing. Like I'm, I'm in the living room, like folding towels and talking to my aunt Susan and my aunt Susan's sitting there like, what are you doing? And I'm just like, I'm, I'm doing the laundry. And she's like, she's laughing. And then so... Yeah, so um, it's like that, you know, it's like that situation where you don't really know what to do when you're dealing with that kind of shit, so it's like, I'll do something to take my mind off it or make it better, and so I, I can really, really relate what Luffy's doing here, like, he's like, oh, Zoro's, I don't know what to do, I'll, I'll polish his sword, because he's gonna need it, and even, even Usopp, this is a very serious scene for a One Piece episode, but I like it, right, there's even a scene with Usopp, where Usopp is there and having the conversation with Luffy, like, Luffy, man, like, you might want to start thinking about the possibility that he might not wake up. And even Sanji's kind of thinking that too. And uh, Luffy's like, no, he'll, he'll wake up. Hey, Sanji, can you make Zoro's favorite food? And even Sanji's like, yeah, I, I can make his favorite food. Uh, what, what is he like? You know, also not having the heart to tell him like, Luffy, he's not going to be able to eat for a while. He might not make it, right? But he's like, oh, what's his favorite food? And like, oh, well, Z Zoro really likes rice balls and he likes beer. And that that is Zoro's, like his favorite food is rice balls and like alcohol is like the favorite thing he likes. So they got that. They nailed that. That was perfect. And um, it, Luffy goes on this kind of like rambling thing where he's like, oh, can we put can we put beer in the rice balls? Oh, or, or maybe like we could give him a, oh, he's probably thirsty. Let's give him some water, right? And he also wants to sleep. Um, maybe we should just let him rest. But he also needs food. But we should probably just let him rest. And he's just rambling. And, and Sanji has a moment. And he's like, listen, being a captain probably has to be the most difficult thing out there. You know, and I, I know about that because Zeph used to be a captain. And that kind of like changes the subject a little bit to get Luffy's mind off of it. But it also shifts over to Sanji's backstory. And he's like, you know, Zeph used to be a captain. And Luffy's like, oh, he used to be the old man? He's like, yep, captain of the dreaded Cook Pirates. And so this leads into him telling the story. But the fascinating thing about this is... I think this is a better vehicle for this, a better establishing, uh, a better setup, as it were, or framing device for Sanji's backstory. Because you know how it goes in the manga and in the anime? It's just a flashback. It's just Sanji watching the fight with the Krieg pirates and everything, and then Sanji just internally has a flashback. He's not telling the story to anybody. It's just him remembering it. Here, it's Sanji actively telling the story to Luffy and Usopp. So they now know about Sanji's past with Zeph and being starved on the rock and Zeph losing a leg. And what's the difference? Well, there's a few differences, but the most notable one is something that we'll get to as a parallel between Sanji's backstory and Luffy's backstory. So 
He tells the story, and it's basically the same thing. We flash back to the orbit nine years ago, uh, where the orbit's at the sea, and it's a it's a cruise ship. It's like a passenger ship. And um, Sanji's, little kid Sanji's in the kitchen, and he's making velouté, which is a French sauce. It's like one of the mother sauces of, of, of French cuisine. It's like there's tomato sauces. There's bechamel. Have you ever made a good bechamel? There's and like hollandaise sauce and everything like that and Sanji's making this velouté and all the other cooks in the kitchen are kind of making fun of him like you'll never serve that high class stuff here it's just going to be basic stuff come on it's just that's all we're serving today and then Sanji's like yeah I'm going to make this really nice meal because I'm going to find the all blue someday all the cooks make fun of him and it's just like oh you hear that boy Sanji's going to find the all blue and it's just like yeah okay um, now the set for the orbit I have a feel it's a very small kind of kitchen and I have a feeling they basically Basically, just partitioned off part of the set for the Baratier just for this little section of the orbit because it's like basically just a hallway instead of a whole kitchen but it works and there's a chef that's you know kind of like oh the all blue is just a legend that chefs tell when they're bored uh, but we're at work right now take this out take this steak out to table five or something like that right so then the pirates board he's like pirates have boarded and so all the chefs leave Sanji they just abandon the child is like we got to get out of here they just saw everybody for themselves and they leave Sanji picks up a kitchen knife and he hides and then Zeph walks into the kitchen and we see a close up of his feet first when he walks in and we see why he's called Red Foot Zeph because his feet are covered in blood and he walks into the kitchen and he looks around and he sees the velouté that Sanji made and this is such a clever change in the costume department like whoever whoever came up with this idea in like the writing room or maybe member of the co costume or the design department I don't know I want to shake their hand I have no idea who you are but thank you so much because this is such a one piece idea Zeph when he was a pirate captain had a bandolier over his captain coat but it wasn't full of, of bullets or ammunition it was filled with like vials of spices, of herbs and spices to use in ingredient, to use in like cooking and stuff. And I'm like, that is brilliant. That is brilliant. The captain of the Cook Pirates has like a, oh yes, needs some parsley, needs some oregano, needs some smoked paprika. You know, it's like that. That is a very Oda esque thing to do. Like I could see Oda drawing Zeph like that. That works 100%. That's just the right amount of goofy for One Piece, okay? So Zeph walks in, he sees the velute, and he's like, Ah, velute! Mmm, yeah, could use more oregano. And he takes out the oregano, and that's when Sanji comes out with a knife. He's like, Oregano's for savages! I'll stab you! You know, and then Zeph, like, knocks him against the wall, pulls out a giant Bowie knife, and he's just like, Ah, getting a little spicy there, little eggplant, aren't she? You know, it's just like, ah! And so Sanji doesn't buckle, though. He's like, you know, I'm gonna find the all blue, and just is like, ah, the all blue, eh? And then at that moment, that's when the entire ship collapses, and then it gets, uh, you know, uh, you know, capsized, uh, and then and see, I know sailing terms. And then they end up stranded on the rock. Now, the rock scene is pretty much exact like it happens in the manga. This is another one they did not change. Um, I, I think they got the number of days they were on the rock, 85 days total. Sanji mentions it. Uh, and then going through all the different food supplies and Zeph telling him, you know, you stay on that side of the rock. We stay on this side. Don't talk. It'll waste energy. You see a ship. Let me know. Uh, you know, you have this bag of food. I have this bag of food. I'm bigger. I'm the adult, so I should have a bigger cut and so you know then we have the shot where after like 70 days go by Sanji goes over to uh you know he's like I've had enough I'm starving I'm gonna go take his food right and then we get the big reveal that Zeph his foot is his leg is gone right now this is something that has always been weird with the adaptations of One Piece this moment has always been changed like in the anime adaptation, they changed it so he doesn't cut off his own leg. He loses his leg when he's trying to save Sanji. Like, the idea is he goes down and Sanji is, like, trapped, and so he needs to get him out. And in the process, he loses the leg, all right, in the, in the wreckage of the ships, okay? So that's he doesn't amputate it and eat it, all right? Um, I guess maybe, I don't know if it was just the thing of the sensibilities at the time, but, like, the idea of, like, a starving man cutting off his own leg and eating it, yeah, that's... That's grisly. That's dark, certainly. But is that something that's, like, so messed up that's like, oh my god, we can't possibly show that. Holy crap, that's grim. Maybe it was just during the time period, like the late 90s, because honestly, I don't think that's really that. Maybe just desensitization of everything later on, because it's like, yeah, 
I mean, sure, that sucks, but it's not something that's so bad that's like, you know, why do you have to censor it? So in this version, they don't show him. In the manga, you actually see Zef picking up the rock and amputating his leg with it. You see it in the anime, and the manga. They change it in the anime, and then obviously in the four kids, they, they change it as well. Actually, in the four kids, they could just basically, oh, I lost my leg in the wreckage or whatever, right? So in this version, uh, they don't show Zef amputating it, but you see the rock covered in blood, and you see the implication of, like, you cut off your own leg and ate it, didn't you? And Zef is just like, yup, you know, that's what happened, all right? And so that's kind of, like, where the flashback ends, and then Sanji kind of, like, wraps it up by saying, you know, we were stranded for 85 days, we were rescued. Point is, he could have left me to die out there, and he didn't. And then we found it this place, okay? I guess the, um... The conversation about how he came up with the name of Baratier and everything like that, like that was left out. But overall, like that, that flashback was pretty much the same. And the reason why this is such a big deal, why Sanji's telling uh, Luffy directly, is Sanji looks at Luffy and he says, Do you have any idea what it's like for someone to lose a limb over your life, to save your life? And Luffy thinks about it for a second and he's like, You know, I actually do. Because of Shanks. That's an angle of this I did not even consider. Wait a minute. Zeph lost his leg to save Sanji. Shanks lost an arm to save Luffy. Different circumstances for sure. But there's a parallel there. And like somebody in the writing room was like, wait a minute. Zeph lost a leg. Lu Shanks lost an arm. Sanji tells the backstory to Luffy, Luffy would probably have something to say about that, right? Now, he doesn't go off into a whole thing. He doesn't tell Sanji the whole story about Shanks and the Lord of the Coast or anything, but, like, there's a moment there of, like, yeah, I do know what that's like. And just like, huh, okay. So it's a little bit of a bonding moment between Sanji and Luffy. I like that. I really like that. I really do. That's nice. We next have a scene where Nami is reading a book to Zoro because that's what she was doing in the meantime while Sanji and Usopp and everybody were talking about like the backstory and everything. So Nami is reading, in fact, Nolan the Liar. It's not just a random book. She's reading Nolan the Liar. And it's like, wow, okay, that's another tieback. Also great for foreshadowing if we are eventually going to get to Jaya, which would probably be season three. You know, we, we're establishing this stuff in season one. Now we have, we know what's coming down the pipeline. So we don't know how, I, I don't know how long the Netflix series is going to last. You know, three, four, five seasons, whenever they're going to stop or whatever. Um, but at, at the very least, you could set some stuff up now for later on and be like, oh, Nolan the Liar. Oh, Jaya. Okay. Oh, it connects back to that book that we were reading. You know what I mean? There you go. So Nami's reading the story of Nolan of like, you know, finding the city of gold. And then he goes and tells the king and then the king's men all get together and they go to find the island and they can't find Jaya die anymore and he's like oh the the city of gold must have sank beneath the ocean and so as that's a whole story however there's a different angle of the way the story is interpreted here okay and also you might bring up like well that book was published in the north blue how does nami have it it's like well it was published in the north blue but i'm sure you know it ended up somewhere like nami getting that book would make sense and also i thought about an idea wouldn't it have been funny because Sanji would have known it. He would have had a copy, probably. Wouldn't it have been interesting if they went into the Baratier to find a book to read to Zoro, and Nami just sees, like, oh, Nolan the Liar, I've heard of this, and just picks it off a shelf in the Baratier? That would be really clever, because Sanji would have definitely had a copy of that. But anyway, so Nami's reading the story, and then Luffy walks in while she's reading the story of, like, you know, he lost the king of... Uh, I mean, like, the king found out that he was lying about the city of gold and everything like that. And Luffy's like, aw, poor guy, losing a whole city, that must have sucked. And it's a different angle from the, the story. Instead of focusing on Noland, they focus on the king of the story of Nolan the Liar. Where they mention, like, um, you know, why, like, Luffy's like, why'd the king have to kill him? You know, and then Nami has a moment where she, like, closes the book and she's like, because sometimes, Luffy, people in power have responsibilities and have to make decisions they don't want to make, but it's for the greater good. And so she's using this kind of like as a, you could have stopped this duel with Zoro and Mihawk. You could have stopped, by the way, Luffy could not have stopped it. Zoro was going to duel Mihawk no matter what. But the fact that Luffy didn't even try really pisses Nami off. Because she's like, you're supposed to be the captain. You're the one supposed to be in charge of these people. And so, like I said, in this version of events, 
I mean, she was friends with the Straw Hats before in the manga, but in this version, we get to see that a lot more, where she sat down with a drink with Zoro, and they had the whole drinking game, and they learned a little bit about each other, and Usopp was drunk, and they were like, oh, he has a certain grace about him, you know? So Nami was kind of, you know, having a little bit of cheering up with the crew. It was like, oh, I guess these are kind of my friends. That's so, that's, this is fun. Like, she's having fun. But she realizes that ultimately she's a member of uh, Arlong's crew and she has to go back to him. Um, but then she sees this moment where Luffy doesn't even bother to try to stop uh, the duel and then Zoro could die because of that. And so understandably, Nami's a little bit pissed off at Luffy here. And you can understand, like, maybe she's taken out her rage on Luffy. Maybe it's not all should be placed on him, but, like, that's Nami trying to cope with this as well, right? So um, they, they focus on the king in the story of like if when you're in a position of power, you have difficult decisions to make. And Luffy's like, yeah, he could have just decided not to execute Nolan. <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, he's like, I can't find the city of gold anywhere. It must have sank beneath the ocean. All right, that makes sense. Nolan, you're a good explorer. I'm not going to kill you. So that's like the way that Luffy's kind of interpreting it, right? Uh, and Luffy even says, you know, stories have different points. Stories have different meanings. And I love that line because I don't know if that was put in there as kind of like a like a fourth wall wink or something, but like stories have different interpretations or you can tell the same story in different ways, which is what this is. You know, this is a different interpretation of the One Piece story, okay? Following the same basic plot beats, but things are going to be different, right? The fact that Nami is still here is an example of that. And this is an example of like, oh my God, Nami's still at the Baratier at this point. She should have betrayed everybody and left by now. It's like, no, I'm actually interested in seeing a version of events if Nami stayed and seeing how she would cope with all this. That's actually interesting as well, right? Gives us more time with her. Um, so... Luffy says, you know, like, he's like, oh, Nami's like, you know, he could die, Luffy. And Luffy's like, and I would do anything to save him. Anything at all. Except tell him to give up on his dreams. So that's the most important thing about this scene right here between Nami and Luffy. It's that Luffy, no matter what, he will not give up on that conviction. That is the one thing he will not be like, oh, you're right, Nami. I should have just told him to give up on his dream. We wouldn't even be, he wouldn't be in this situation right now. Once again, Zoro would have fought Mihawk no matter what. But the idea is that Luffy will not budge on this. He's nothing if not true to his convictions. He's like, this is, I will never tell someone to give up their dream no matter what. Because to Luffy, that's tantamount to dying, is giving up your dreams. You know what I mean? So from that perspective, he's not budging. And so Nami just kind of gets up and just kind of walks out because it's like, you know, it's like, oh, you don't understand or something. And she she actually has a moment where she says, um, you know what, Luffy, we all have dreams. We all have goals in our lives. But you know what? We have to grow up sometimes and realize that's not life is all like sunshine and rainbows. And she kind of walks out. Right. So that's her saying that, like, you know, she had dreams at one point and then Arlong ripped all that away from her. And now she's basically working as a slave for the people that killed her mom, you know, and, and so enslaved her entire village. And so Nami's basically a very, very cynical view of this of just like, yeah, we all have dreams, Luffy, but then we have to wake up. You know what I mean? And then she, she walks out. Right. Um. We have a brief scene between Kobe and Garp at this point where uh, Kobe, I think, is trying to get Garp away from hunting Luffy, where he's like, Garp, you know, Vice Admiral, you just don't understand the way that Luffy is. And, uh, you know, I've known him for a while. And Garp is like, well, I have, too. He's my grandson. What do you mean? And he's like, I think you're going about this the wrong way. I think you just don't understand who Luffy is no matter what. He's always going to be a pirate. It doesn't matter what you tell him. It doesn't matter what you want for him. He's always going to be a pirate. There's nothing you can do about this. So I think Kobe is trying to like, come on, just let him be a pirate. You know, it's like, there's no, there's no point. You're never going to convince him. So Garp interprets that to be like, oh, you're right. I'm never going to convince him with words. All right, then. And then he walks away and Kobe's like, oh, what did I just do? <laughs> you know, what did I just do? So we'll cut back to that later. Um, so now we have the shot where Arlong, the, one of the biggest changes of the entire se uh, first season, Arlong, Chu, and Karubi arrive at the Baratier, which, I mean, like, that doesn't really, once again, Krieg is not there anymore, Mihawk left, there's no other conflict, why not just introduce Arlong earlier, so, we already introduced him earlier, way back in, like, episode three after Buggy and everything, but, like, let's introduce Arlong now, like, really what he's all about, because we're gonna set up the fights in Arlong Park, right, in, like, the next couple episodes, so why not? And it's like, why wouldn't Arlong visit the Baratier, like, is it that ridiculous? In this version of events, 
Arlong already rules the East. He's already like all the pirates in the East kind of listen to him or are supposed to listen to him. He's the mafia boss of the East, essentially. So he's like, why wouldn't he uh, swim down to the Baratier for that, you know, lunch special or something like that, right? So he walks in with his crew and you got the fish man that is the waiter. And he's like, oh, a fish man waiter bowing and listening to humans, you know, like spits on the floor, like you've, you, you're, you've betrayed your kind or something like that, right? And he walks down into the Baratier and he like, he's like, nobody move except for you. And he like grabs a random dude out of a chair and like yeets him into a wall. And then they all like sit down at the table, like they own the place, right? And um, uh, Zeph walks out and he's, and Arlong's like, who are you? And it's like, Zeph's like, I own this joint. And it's just like, oh, okay. Well, maybe you could help me then. I'm looking for a straw hat pirate. Goes by the name of Luffy. And Zeph, of course, is not going to sell out his number one chore boy. So Zeph is like, Luffy, no, I have no idea who that is. Ugh. Well, he's like, but he's like, hey, I'll tell you what. You can have anything on that menu. No charge at all. And so Zeph is kind of like trying to diffuse the situation as much as possible. He doesn't want this. He doesn't want his restaurant to turn into a bloodbath, right? Into a shark attack tank, right? So he's like, he's like, anything on the menu you want, you can have any meal. And so he's like, Arlong's like, well, I already have a meal. He has like a big thing of like a tomahawk steak right in front of him. Ooh, I should get some tomahawk steaks. Do you ever have those things? God, they're good. Anyway, he's like, yeah, I got, I got a food. I got a meal right in front of me, but if Straw Hat Luffy's not here by the time I finish this, you know, people's heads, there's going to be some people that are going to get decapitated, kind of, you know what I mean? There's going to be a shark attack, if you get my meaning, right? We have a moment where Usopp and Luffy are next to Zoro. And I think Usopp's talking to him a little bit, and then Luffy's there, and Usopp's like, go on, Luffy, talk to him, say something. And Luffy's like, I wouldn't know what to say. Once again, playing very much with, like, Luffy's not used to these kind of situations, guys. He has no idea what to do. It makes probably Luffy very uncomfortable to be in a situation with his dying friend and, like, talk to him. And he's just like, I don't know what to... Hey, Zoro. How you doing, buddy? No, wait. Let, let me start over. Hey, Zoro. It's me, Luffy. Ah, that's not right. You know, it's like, Luffy just, just, just doesn't understand. And it's just like, it makes sense for the character. It really does. Where he's trying, okay? That's when um, Nami walks in and is like, because she was in the Baratie, like in the higher balcony, like hiding. And she saw Arlong come in. And, you know, like, I'm looking for Straw Hat Luffy. And Nami's like, oh, shit. She runs back to the Mary and she's like, we need to go. Luffy, Arlong is here. He has the highest bounty in the, East, in the East Blue. He's looking for you specifically. We need to weigh anchor and get out of here. And because, like, there's no other reason for them to stay. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, like Usopp, Nami, and Zoro, they're all here. Uh, there's nobody to fight. Krieg is gone. You know, Krieg has never showed up. So it was like, from Nami's perspective, we can get the anchor and we could just sail away and hope for the best with, um, with Zoro or whatever, right? And so Luffy's like, I'm not running. I'm going to go see what he's all about. Like, Luffy, you will die. <laughs> and so Luffy's like, no, I'm going to go do this. You know, once again, maybe Luffy justifying it like, oh, this is something, beating somebody up. Okay, now that's something I know. That's something I know how to do. But I love the idea of Nami pleading with the crew to be like, we can leave. We can get out of here. We can still run away from this. She's still trying to run away from her past. Maybe Nami, there's something there that's like, maybe I could run away with the Straw Hats. Maybe I could get away from Arlong. Maybe I don't have to listen to him anymore, right? And so Luffy's like, you know, uh, kind of like uh, obstinate here. And he's like, I'm not going to do that. And he goes to walk into the Baratier. Uh, and then Nami's just like, okay, well, you know what? I guess that's not the way things are going to go. I know how what I have to do now. And that's kind of that's kind of what establishes not just Nami looking at Arlong's wanted poster like in the manga, but Arlong actually showing up and then her uh, opting to run. And they're like, no. That's when Nami realizes, like, okay, I'm still a member of Arlong's crew. I know what I have to do to make sure Luffy doesn't die. I'm going to have to give Arlong the map and then make sure that, you know, they can get away. Right? That kind of stuff, right? Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. I think we have the... Well, we have a moment with Arlong's speech. So, Arlong kind of gets up in the Baratia and he kind of goes and, like, says, you know, oh, fish man and humans. You know, humans live on the surface. Fish men are relegated to below... And why, you know, you are treated so much more superior to fishmen. Fishmen, by every single respect, are better than humans. We're stronger, we're faster, we're hungrier. He's, like, threatening all of the, the, um, 
all of the uh, patrons of the Baratier. There's even the one dude, I forget his name, but he's the dude that has like the uh, the old school, like colonial, like the powdered wig kind of thing. And he goes up and he's like, you know, snarling in this guy's face. It's just like, you hate fishmen, don't you? Rawr! And then, <laughs> and then the guy's sitting there. He's actually pretty chill. He's there eating his food and he's just like, I have no quarrel with your kind. And just like, Ugh. you know, and so everybody's like, he's doing this big speech and we're learning a little bit more about Arlong's like why he's doing what he's doing something we really don't find out the full ramifications of until Fishman Island way later okay but he goes on this speech and then in the middle of that uh, Luffy walks in Luffy and Usopp and Sanji they all walk into the Baratier and he's like which one of you is Arlong and Arlong's like who wants to know who's the dead man that wants to know and Luffy's like I'm Straw Hat Luffy and he's like oh okay well, actually, I have a word. I need, I need to have a word with you, actually. And so there's this funny scene where um, they're walking down the steps, like Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji. They're kind of walking down the steps to confront Arlong, and they look at each other. And um, I think, I, I can't remember if it was Arlong that says it first, but one of them is like, I thought you would be bigger. And then I think it's Arlong that says it first, like, I thought you'd be bigger. And Luffy says the same thing. He's just like, I thought the same about you, too. So once again, I think that's like, a, yeah, Arlong is like eight or nine feet tall in the in the actual manga. But here's the thing. Like, there are characters in this story that are way bigger than Arlong, right? Like Whitebeard, and then Kaido, and then Big Mam, and then all these other huge... Gecko Moria, Kuma, right? Out of all of these characters that are like really, really, really big... Once we get to them, you have to do something with that. Like, Whitebeard is not going to work as just, like, a normal dude. Whitebeard is not going to work as, like, a six-foot-two guy. You kind of need to make Whitebeard big. You need to make Kuma big. But when it comes to characters like Arlong, who's, like, eight feet tall, nine feet tall, it's like, yeah, some stuff, some menace is definitely lost making him shorter. But I, I'm okay, I'm okay with that. Like, okay, you made Arlong from, like, nine feet tall to, like, six foot four. Because the guy that plays him, uh, McKinley Belcher III, uh, he's a tall guy. He's a tall guy. So it's, like, it's not like, you know, they're making Arlong, like, five foot five, like my height or something like that. Um, but, dude, season two, we're going to be getting the little guard and we're going to have the giants, like... I don't think Oda is going to move on that. I don't think Oda is going to be like, yeah, we can just remove the giants from the story. We don't need to have the giants. It's like, no, the giants are integral to One Piece. You need to have the giants. And you can't just have the giants be like eight feet tall either. You need to make them giants. That's kind of the point of their plot line, all right? So once we get there, maybe the budget will increase. We'll be able to have actual giants, you know, and, and you know, once the bigger characters start showing up. But in the case with Arlong, there's like a three foot difference it's it's not that big of a deal to me right here and now uh maybe even like doflamingo like doflamingo you can make doflamingo just like a tall guy like six foot six or something like that for dofi i think that would be fine but like when you get to kuma and moria hancock also can be like because all the warlords are like a ridiculous height i think mihawk is the shortest one right and so i think mihawk's the only one that has like a normal human kind of height mihawk and buggy of course um blackbeard is even really big but even blackbeard you can make him like like, you know, just like a tall dude, like six foot something, you know what I mean? Like, that's fine for those characters, but for certain characters, you have to have them bigger. But anyway, so um, they're like, Luffy's like, well, how did you find me? And that's when we have a fun scene where Chu reaches into a bag and pulls out Buggy's head that they had. And he's like, oh, hey, Straw Hat, how you doing? He's like, Burpee, you're here? It's like, it's Buggy, but all right, yeah. And he mentions that, like, yeah, I had eyes and ears everywhere. Remember, I told you. And then an ear pops out of Luffy's, the brim of his hat, like the red uh, strap of Luffy's straw hat, pops out and like reattaches to Buggy, and he's like, ah, finally, stereo. So they have stereo in the One Piece world. Of course they do, right? But he's just like, ah, oh, man, finally, I can hear again. And Luffy's like, you were listening to everything we said? And he's like, yeah, I was. And I got old fast because you shittiots have no idea what you're doing. I love, I love, once again, Jeff Ward playing Buggy is so funny. Um, in, in the uh, version of the manga, it's like flashy. He always uses the word flashy. In this version, it's shitty. But you know what? I love it. Like when Zoro goes to cut his head off and he's like, ha ha, surprise, shithead. And then he calls them like all shitty it's right here. I'm like, okay, this works. This works for Buggy. He's very, very sarcastic, but I'm loving it. Okay. And so Buggy's powers also get a huge boost in this version because Buggy not only like there's a set 
like perimeter that he can use his powers, the chop chop powers on. But in the live action, it's like he can like lift up his feet and use his feet to attack, something he can't do in the manga. And also, I guess he has a crazy long range if he put that ear in Luffy's hat like a while ago. You know what I mean? Like, and he was able to track Luffy all the way to the Baratier. Like, he his power works for like a seemingly no distance. I mean, no no um, upper limit of the distance he can control his body parts. That's really powerful, and if they're going to continue with that that uh, that broken ability, then it's like that'd be some really interesting things that Buggy could do, you know. So we'll see, we'll see in the future what can happen with that, right? Like in in the version of the events, like Buggy's body can be separated over miles. Like you could take Buggy's arm and and travel to the other side of the world with the arm. Now the arm is not going to like decompose or anything, but he also can't control it anymore. You know what I mean? It's just an arm, and then when it gets back in range, he can manipulate it. Like that's the way it works in the um in the manga. Zef shoots Arlong before things could get even further, before Luffy and Arlong have their fight, before they, you know, have their conflict. Uh, Zef takes out a pistol, shoots Arlong in the back. It doesn't do anything, and so that really showcases the endurance of a fish man. Uh, Karubi breaks Zef's peg leg. That gets Sanji all pissed. And he's like, Zef, no! And so Sanji's doing a bunch of cool kick attacks. He's hitting Karubi left and right. He hits Karubi in the neck, and Sanji, his, uh, his leg gets grabbed. And he's like, oh, no, you're tough. And so they start their fight. And Luffy's like, wow, that guy can fight. I want him on my crew, right? And so Luffy, are, and, Zora, uh, Luffy and Arlong... And so Luffy and Arlong begin their fight now, okay? Now this fight, um, it's more of just like Luffy getting tossed around on the floor. He uses pistol, Arlong grabs it and just pulls him in and it's just like, Rrgh. you know, like just being really scary. Now there is one transition in the fight that I don't think, it was a little bit rough and it's the scene where um, they kind of grab Luffy, like they're on the lower level of the Baratier, right? So Arlong is like down below after descending the staircase, grabs Luffy, pulls him in, and there's a quick cut to Luffy getting knocked out of the front door of the Baratie. Like, there's a cut where he's like, he's like, I'm going to show you how strong a fish man is or something like that. And then it just immediately cuts to the door. I just feel like that scene could have been done a little bit better to get them outside. You know, like, maybe they could have fought, like, a little bit up. The, like, Arlon could have tossed him on the stairs, and then Luffy goes up the stairs, and then they fight there on, like, the entrance way, and then they get punched through the door. You know, Luffy gets punched through the door or something like that, maybe. But whatever, that's, like, a, that's a small little nitpick. So they get back on that little uh, fighting stage where Mihawk and Zoro had their duel. And so they fight there a little bit. And it's very clear Luffy's getting his ass handed to him. Arlong's picking him up and just beating him down and everything like that. And then he has him, like, over the ocean. Like, he's going to deliver. He's going like, to bite out his neck or something and just drop him in the water. Nami arrives. And this is where we have Nami's betrayal moment. Oh, by the way, Usopp was just hiding under a table the entire time during that fight. He was just like, I don't know what's going on. You know? And so uh, it's very Usopp for this point in the story. So uh, Nami comes comes out though and she's now wearing a revealing like outfit so she's showing off her her sawfish tattoo and uh because the next episode is literally called the girl with the sawfish tattoo which is a parody of the girl with the dragon tattoo which is yeah so if you've ever seen that movie so uh nami comes out with the tattoo and she's like arlong i got the map let's go and then luffy's like nami you work for arlong and just arlong's like ah sister nami has been a loyal member of the arlong pirates for many years now and luffy's like this isn't true nami it's impossible! And Nami's like, no, nah, I, I work for him. I'm like, no! And so, um, but she does manage to save Luffy's life because, you know, hands are along the map and like, let's go, let's go back home. And then uh, says, hey, don't waste your time eating and killing a devil fruit user. Just let the ocean do it for you. And Arlong's like, yeah, good point. And then just tosses Luffy into the water and he hits the water and he begins to drown, of course. Arlong and Nami depart for the Konomi Islands. That's when uh, Sanji shows up in the moment where Sanji uh, rips off his shirt. We see Taz Skyler's impeccably chiseled abs and he dives in and he like pulls Luffy out. You know, like that's the scene we had in the manga, like except instead of happening with the whole Krieg pirate fight, it happens with Arlong here. So we still have the shot where Sanji saves him. Pulls so Usopp comes out as well and Sanji helps him out of the water and everybody's just like, okay, you're gonna be all right, Luffy. And like, yeah, we gotta go save Nami. We gotta bring her back, right? She left with Arlong. What's going on here, right? So um, we have a few more scenes left in the episode. We have the scene with Garp, the final scene where he's on his ship. And he's just like, all right, 
We've been chasing after the straw hats with half, no more half measures. He turns into like Mike Ehrman Trout from Better Call Saul or, or Breaking Bad. He's like, no more half measures, Kobe. You know, it's like the gloves are coming off. We will bring in the straw hat pirates by any means necessary. And everyone's like, no, yeah, go Marines. Yeah. So let, let's bring in these no name pirates that Garp has this weird obsession with for some reason. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, so we'll see where that goes. That, that'll be a tie back to um, the, the actually the last episode of the season. Uh, but then we have a shot where Sanji is leaving the Baratier, or rather Sanji is, like, cleaning up the Baratier after the attack of the Fishman Pirates, and Zeph is, like, there, and he's like, you know, you don't have to help me clean. I didn't order you to clean. And Sanji's just like, well, you know, you're you're injured, so I gotta do it, old man. And, and Zeph and him have a fight where it's like, you know, you're wasting your place in this dump. Get out of here. He's like, fine, I will go. He's like, you've been blabbing about the All Blue ever since you were a kid, Sanji. Go out there and follow your dreams, damn it. And Sanji's like, maybe I will, old man. And then that's, you know, they leave, and so that's kind of the moment there. It was like, get out there, my stupid son. Go out on an adventure. You know, like that kind of thing there. We have a shot where Zoro is finally, he finally recovers. He finally wakes up. So Luffy's there on the bed after the whole events with Nami and everything. And he's just like, after he was like also soundly defeated by Arlong, he's just like, Zoro, I've been trying to think about what to say to you, but I now realize what I want to say. It's, we need you, Zoro. I need you. I need you now. And then Zoro's like, are you going to keep talking or are you going to let me get some sleep? And like, oh my God, Zoro, you're alive. He's alive. And it's like, oh God, Luffy, you're going to pop the stitches out. Oh, God. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, Zoro survived, and he's essentially, you know, that is the treatment that healed him. Okay, so Zeph did stitch him up, and they do that. Instead of leading, leaving the wound just untreated for a couple of days, which is what happens in the manga, this is like, they had to treat him, like, right away. And so, that's that's Zoro. So, he's back in action. Usopp comes in. Like, oh, my God, he's still alive. This is great. So, um, he also has another moment, another line, another, like, kind of monologue uh, where he says... I vow to stand by your side until you find the One Piece. You're my captain, and I am your first mate. I love that they had a line like that, like kind of like a sequel to the monologue of like, you know, I will never lose again kind of thing. They add this in where Zoro explicitly refers to himself as the first mate of the Straw Hat Pirates because that was never a position he was, like, stated to have, okay? It was never mentioned that he was the vice captain or the first mate or a swordsman or a fighter. His title has kind of, like, always been ambiguous. It was never just, like, like we assume he's a vice captain. He's the same position that, like, Rayleigh had on Roger's ship. But I don't think we've ever seen, like, a title box, like Roranora Zoro first mate of Straw Hat crew. I don't think we've ever seen that, but they expressly mention it here, okay? And so that was clever. That was like, okay, we've never had it in the story, so let's have it here. It makes sense, right? Okay, right before he passes out, he's like, I vow to never lose again. Is that okay, King of the Pirates? And the first thing, one of the first things he says after he wakes up is, you're my captain, I'm your first mate, let's do this, let's find the One Piece. Like, yeah, but first, we gotta get Nami back. He's like, what happened? Because <laughs> Zoro has no idea. You know, Zoro has no idea what just went down, right? So, uh, we have the moment where the Straw Hats all begin to depart the Baratier. Sanji walks on board with his bag, and he's like, I'm ready to go. And so uh, the, the departure is not as impactful as in the anime or the manga, where Sanji's like bowing to all the chefs, and uh, they all kind of tell him to get out of there. Like, oh, Sanji, your cooking sucks. It turns out we all hated your cooking the whole time. Get out of here. You know, we, we'll do way better without you being here. And so they, now all that's kind of cut. I mean, there's a little bit of it with Zeph. And, of course, uh, a lot of the chefs weren't shown. So it's just um, it's just Zeph and Patty and, like, one other uh, chef that's, like, outside saying goodbye to, to Sanji. And Sanji's on, like, um, the uh, the stern of the Mary as it's sailing away. And he's kind of just like, you know, Zeph, um, you know... I owe you my life, and Zeph's like, keep your feet dry, Sanji, you know, and just, like, have, you know, find the all-blue someday, and Sanji begins to cry and weep, and he's like, I'll never forget you! Why? I'll never forget you! <laughs> you know, it's like, as, as they're sailing away, as they're having the conversation, rather than Sanji bowing. If I was gonna say the scene in the manga was, like, a 10 out of 10, I would probably say this is around a 6 out of 10 in terms of, like, capturing the moment. It's still there. It's just something that's just like, okay, we, we have to have this moment really quick, and then we have to move away. You know what I mean? And so that's that's what it is. But uh, I, I prefer the manga version better. But this is what we got. It's it's something that's... It's 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 um, it's passable. Let's, let's call it that, right? So with that being said, they're now sailing to the Konomi Islands, 
And they're like, well, how do we get there? Because Nami was the navigator. And it's like, well, don't, Luffy's like, don't worry, I know a guy. And so we go down into the, into the uh, part of the Mary, into like the, um, like the captain's quarters area, and, and it turns out that they have Buggy's head. So Arnolong's crew left Buggy when they all left. So Buggy's there, and he's just like, hey guys, how you doing? Do, 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 do. And then that's the end of the episode. So Buggy is going to be the one to kind of tell them, like, I sense my body in that direction. This is actually, that's actually might be a clever way if they change the powers around to make it be like Buggy now has like a homing device to like where his body is. It's like, I know my body is exactly in that direction. Just go in that direction and we'll eventually get it. Right. Okay. So it might be something along those lines. Right. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, uh, that's the end of episode six. I am hoping this video is okay. I'm hoping the audio is not corrupted in this one. Um, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see for that, won't we? Yeah! But anyway, uh, episode 7 and 8, last episodes of the Arlong Park arc is, uh, gonna be the last part of it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. What was your favorite, uh, part of episode 6? The chef and the, sh and the chore boy. What'd you feel about, um, Zoro's, like, injury and Zeph healing him and the backstory with Sanji and Zeph and Arlong showing up at the Baratier and the way that Nami was, you know, the, her betrayal in this one. Uh, yeah, let me know about that down below. Uh, there's also a scene I, I missed. It's a very brief scene when Nami is going back in the ship to get the map. She's like, Zoro's still unconscious, and she has like one last line to Zoro of like, I told you I didn't have any friends because I can't have any friends because I always betray my friends. I always end up hurting them in the end, so that's why I don't have any. So that's like, it, it gives us more dimension of Nami's betrayal rather than just like she sees a wanted poster and then leaves. And then we find out about this stuff after the fact later. It's like we now learn about this kind of now. So there's that. But anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching signing out. See you for episode seven, whenever that'll be.